Knowledge is the key to helping us climb out of the abyss. Of uncertainty, hopelessness, despair, homelessness, and poverty. Knowledge is the key to unlock tomorrow's dreams, but knowledge is also the key to ensuring that each and every one of you can stand up to be counted. It is the key that will give you and every one of you the ability to say, that really ain't the way it is. It is my hope that as you move through today's agenda, that you will find new knowledge about your tenant rights, that you will embrace that knowledge so that the next time that you are confronted with some clearly unreasonable negotiation of thought, you can say, I am empowered. I know what I am entitled to as a tenant. I know that I learned from that government agency that I do have rights. We have all gotten to where we are because somebody, a parent, a teacher, bent down and helped us pick up our boots. Let us remember those who helped to bring you this far, but let us not forget that there is still more to be done. I hope that each and every one who took time to attend today's summit will walk away energized, ready to become the next Thurgood, ready to stand up and be heard. Today's program offers a great deal of information about a great number of topics. There's one guy who's not in this room, but you'll see him walking around. His name is Steve Dudick. He's one of our attorney advisors at the OTA. He is one of the most tremendous young men that I've ever hired. He put this whole summit together. Uh, he's done a tremendous job. This morning, as we are in this room, we have another session going on upstairs in room four, A, B, and C, for real estate professionals. Last year, we were given the, the permission to cert have a certified class. And so we certify our Renters' Rights 101 course of training for the real estate professionals. Why? There's that guy. Hold on, that guy over there. Mr. Steve Dudek, give that man a hand, please. He's also expecting his first baby in two weeks, so we really want to give him a hand. <laughs> um, however, for those of you who are tenants, if you look in your program, we are also teaching Renters' Rights 101, and you really should take the course. Why? Because you need to know everything you need to know about the statutes that govern the apartments that you live in. Now I'm gonna ask you a question. How many of you have really read your lease? Well, that's a good handful. There are so many people who sign a lease that never read it. Let me give you just one little story. We had some boys out at Georgetown staying in a McMansion a couple years ago, and they all moved into this place paying $10,000 a month. 10,000. The one thing they didn't do was read the lease. In the lease, the landlord said, you will pay a fine of $10,000 if you do not deliver my mail to me. You will pay a $10,000 fine if you don't do this and if you don't do that. So when the young men started to vacate at the end of the season, the landlord said, you owe me $60,000. You failed to do what the lease said you were supposed to do. So into our office they came. Now, of course, we litigated it and we won. But the point being is that so often the, the lease has things embedded in it that are unreasonable and ridiculous. And as tenants, you have a responsibility because most people are not trained to realize that when you sign the lease, it is a legal contract that you are saying, I, I agree to these terms and conditions. Hopefully by taking Renters Rights 101, that can be alleviated. The program that follows me is probably one of the most important in today's uh, fiscal year because it is going to focus specifically on the new eviction with dignity statute. We have the pleasure of having the U.S. Chief Marshal with us, Robert Brandt. He's a wonderful guy. He's worked with my office, the council's office, anybody's office that wanted to talk to him in order to ensure that his goal to change 
the way evictions occurred in the city actually happened. And when I testified on Monday, when I got to the point of testifying about the bill related to this, I said, in the ghost of Marion Barry, I stand before you to talk about evictions with dignity. Because it was Marion who brought that particular terminology to the council when he was chairman of the housing committee. And so it is in his memory that we are discussing something that he thought was important for the tenant population in the District of Columbia. So I want you to listen up to what they have to say because it's important for you to know that now your things cannot be put on the street. Hmm. That's the biggest improvement, isn't it? It's important to know that you can leave your things right now under the temporary legislation for seven days inside the unit after the eviction occurs. Wow. So he said, that's why I say pay attention. Pay attention to what's going on in these, these particular workshops because they're loaded with new things. There's a workshop this afternoon that will talk about the single family changes in TOPA. What is TOPA? What's that again? Right, the Tenant Opportunity to Purchase Act. So those changes are things that if you are a tenant and you're living in a single family house in particular, there are some things that you will benefit from, maybe, if they apply. We will be talking about the federal laws, and God knows we need to have your attention on that now, don't we? Anybody been watching the hearings? Oh, okay. So we know that it's important to understand about funding. And un, un, we didn't know what was going to happen with either the House or the Senate as it related to funding for HUD and HOME and CDBG and tax credits and all of these things, the things that make affordable housing through the development communities. But in fact, uh, the Senate and the House weren't that bad. They did fund these programs again instead of cutting them all together, which is what the administration had proposed. The courses that we are trying to bring to you, and there's a new one, and the title of it is, This Is Not Court TV. If you watch Judge Judy, don't make the mistake of thinking that's what the housing conditions calendar is about. If you don't know how to represent yourself or go what they say is pro se, we want to help you learn how to do that because it's important to know how to represent yourself. So there's a variety of things that we've tried to do this year that directly impact your day-to-day -day life and those are the tenants that may be in your community. Those are the tenants who may be part of your tenant associations. If you haven't got a tenant association, attend one of those workshops to learn about how to develop one. We'll be talking about bylaws in that one, which is a very, very important aspect of governance. So there are many, many factors and many, many things that we're covering today uh, that are directly here for you. We believe that it is important, it is our job as public servants to ensure that we give you what you pay for in your taxes and you do pay my salary. So I am beholding to each and every one of you for one, taking time out of your life to come and visit with us today. Uh, we know that this room will swell as time goes on. The morning is always the slowest part of the morning. But I do hope that uh, you will walk away this afternoon saying, you know what, I'm really glad I showed up today. I'm really glad that I showed up. So thank you for your time. And I will, what time do we have, gentlemen? What time is it? Oh, I'm, I, I have t t 10 more minutes to talk. <laughs> Does anyone have a question? I'll answer a question about the OTA or anything else. Yes, ma'am. Can you stand up and tell me who you are? You're going to hear about that starting at 930. You're going to hear as much as you ever want to know about that. Ma'am, in your, in, your, in your packet, you will find a handout that gives you the entire process, how it works. Yes, 
inside of your your uh, your uh, that that hand that that tote bag we gave you, you should have a handout that specifically addresses the entire eviction process. We put one together. You've got it in your hand right now. Okay, so um, make sure you go through the packet and see what's there. We tried to put not a whole lot of paper there, but we did want to make sure that you had the information you needed specifically for this session this morning. Can I ask, answer another question? Yes. Well, that's a good question. I've been trying to answer that for 11 years. I don't know. Uh, maybe I should write, I will pay you to come and sit in these chairs. Uh, just kidding. I, I don't know. I, I think that, uh, as I said, um, when we're winning, we, when we're losing, we show up. When we don't think we have a problem, well, maybe... And there's always competing events going on every, you know, it's amazing how in Washington, D.C., if you look at the schedule of a week, my God, there's always so many things happening. There's a festival today in Adams Morgan. There's this marathon running somewhere. Usually we bump up against the 8th Street Festival. You know, it, there's always something. It's hard to, de de to determine what happens in terms of people showing up. Uh, we have over 70 people scheduled just for the Real Estate 101 class. So a lot of the, the registrations, those individuals are probably upstairs already. That's why they're not down here. Uh, by lunchtime, the room will be packed, as you well know. Uh, we do this every year. So it's hard to say. Uh, we did a lot of advertisements. Uh, we were in all of the local newspapers. We were on the buses. Um, we did a lot of stuff, but maybe there's something that we missed that would bring maybe one, if everybody brought one with them, the room would be a little fuller. Ma'am. Yes, ma'am, we do. We've had that for a long time. They change, though. That, that's a work in progress, and they, real, they elect new people, and people move. There's always something going on at a property site. Um, and we deal with all tenants. It's not tenants just in public housing or subsidized housing, but tenants who pay $5,000 a month. Everybody is represented by the Office of the Tenant Advocate. There's over 350,000 tenants. So you would think of all of that, we could get 5% of them here. Uh, but Saturday is a, is a day when people are also taking care of personal things. So, you know, it's a competing interest. Um, and as a former community organizer, one of the things that I learned early on it only takes five people to make a real difference sometimes. Uh, I believe that every one of you that are here has a responsibility to communicate the information to those who couldn't come. Uh, as an example, we just got finished, and, and, and in the back, let me introduce Tamala Tolton, who is my right, left, and center hand. She also runs the Emergency Housing Program Coordination for our office, and most of you are aware that on the 18th of September, uh, Arthur Capper Senior property burnt uh, 125, 162 units of housing. We housed 125 people in 24 hours. Uh, they are still in hotels now. We have been working nonstop as we were planning for this meeting with the government to ensure that these individuals are being taken care of and will be in the hotels until we have uh, temporary replacement housing for each and every one of them. So our role is not just a summit, it deals with legislation. We testified on Monday about the emergency legislation related to the eviction law. Uh, we believe that it's an important that you become more educated about the civic process because that's where it counts. If I can get you all the same group of people here in a room to testify before city council about something that relates to tenants, the law usually can be changed. If I'm standing there on your behalf, only the one testifying, the city council says, well, I guess it doesn't really matter now, does it? 
It used to be a time in our country when people marched. It used to be a time in our country when people came together. That time has changed. Why? We're looking at our phone. We get a message. We're going to Skype. We're going to webinar. We are not actively face-to-face -face with the politicians that we elect. We're not face-to-face -face with the government officials that we have in these jobs. That's when change really occurs. But change is slow. It doesn't happen overnight. Can't you tell when your hair starts turning gray that change is slow? <laughs> Nothing happens without an effort. Um, and I am always encouraged when any seats are filled. When we started this uh, in 2005, we were at uh, Murray School and we had 100 people. That's what the first summit was about. And I was just absolutely thrilled that 100 tenants from the city came to listen to what we had to say. And over the course of time, we've expanded. I started with three people. Dolores Anderson, where are you? She's in the back. She was one of the first three people ever to work in the office of the tenant advocate. Uh, Christopher is out in the hall, I think. Where's Christopher? All right, Christopher Lucas. He was the second person that worked for the Office of the Tenant Advocate. He's a former Marine. He still works for the Office of the Tenant Advocate. It was the three of us in a small room, uh, and that was it. And I can't tell you the number of things and the conditions that we found people in, and some of those conditions haven't changed. But what does change is our ability to become more informed, and then we become more forceful. As a tenant myself, long time ago, I was one of the people that came to Washington and closed HUD down. Uh, that's when they used to call me Little Red. Um, there was a reason for that. But the passion that I bring to this job is one of, I am unforgiving when it comes to the tenant community. It is our ultimate responsibility to be your voice. And without your presence, we can't be heard. So I encourage you to, next time around, think about how we get more seats filled at 9 o'clock. I'm sure that they will be filled when we do some, some of the other programs. But I'm not, I'm not discouraged by the lack of all the seats being filled. Uh, I remember when Vince Gray was, uh, uh, he was actually a council member, and he came to one of these early sessions. He said, he said the exact same thing you said. How come all these seats aren't filled? Because we know there's 200 people that have a problem somewhere in the city, don't we? Somebody's roof isn't fixed. Somebody has some cockroaches in their apartment. Somebody's got mice running around doing a disco. Somebody's got something going on that causes them discomfort on a daily basis. So why aren't they here? I can't answer that question. Maybe I need to put a movie on or something. I don't know. But we'll figure it out together. Now I'd like to bring up the panel that is going to be officiating uh, this important subject this morning. I don't know where Dennis Taylor is. He's our general counsel. Um, he is going to be the moderator of this program. Uh, accompanying him this morning will be the U.S. Marshal, Robert Brandt. Robert, you want to come on up? And we have a young lady, and I'm not sure I can pronounce her name, and I don't know if she's here. Um, but this is the gentleman who, uh, with his wonderful smile, he has, he's done something that needed to be done in this city after 23 years. I remember sitting down with him uh, when I called and asked if we could meet with him. And he talked about 23 years being in this job. And finally, he was moving us from the dinosaur age to the 21st century. And I don't think we could be more happy, do you, that we're not going to have people's things on the street, you think? So, Robert, why don't you go ahead and take a seat? I'm just killing time. Here's Dennis. Okay. Come on in here, Mr. Taylor. Is your other panelist with you? Yes, us? she is. Okay, where is she? Is Somewhat she following me. <laughs> okay. This is Dennis Taylor. Dennis has been with me for ten and a half years, uh, formerly counsel with the Department of Consumer and Regulatory Affairs. He's now general counsel and has been general counsel for the Office of the Tenant Advocate for a very, very long time. So Dennis, I now turn the program over to you. Well, thank you very much. Is someone gonna set the clock so I know when to stop talking? <laughs> oh. No, this is the all important clicker. 
Okay, folks, I know that there are times that you have uh, watched public television. There's a show that you were really looking forward to. Well, this has a laser. <laughs> and before you got into that presentation you were really looking for, there was the pledge drive. So consider this portion the pledge drive. First of all, as will be explained later, our topic today is a temporary act that is passed by the council. We'll get into more detail about that later, but I just want you to be aware of that. It, the, right now, what we're going to describe is not permanent. There will be opportunities for your involvement. We'll describe that a little bit later. Now, some of you are going to have some suggestions, I imagine. How should it be better? And I'll be going into more details later, but I want to stress one right now. Because many of you, by the time we get done talking, will have ideas. This needs to change. And you want to get that out before you forget it. And the way you'll do that is go to room 5, 1.30, right after lunch, and Mr. Joel Cohn will be doing his uh, legislative panel, and you'll want to give all the good ideas there. Mr. Cohn, would you wave your hand so they know who you are? Please don't badger him before then. He... Okay, thank you. Now, there are going to be some of you that I expect will have questions about the new procedures we're going to talk about. I think in your folders, each of you will find a 3x5 index card. If I'm really lucky, you'll find a pen. Uh, so write that question down and give it to Mr. Amir Sadegi. Would you please wave your hand, please? Uh, find him. Uh, he will be our uh, question, uh, we'll say the question moderator. Before going any further, I have to give great thanks to Chief Tenant Advocate Johanna Shreve and uh, Stephen Dudek, uh, OTA's new education outreach coordinator who coordinated this event for their confidence in me to give this presentation. I wouldn't be up here if not for them. And, oh, I'm not the only one up here. So yes, I am Dennis Taylor. I am the general counsel of the Office of the Tenant Advocate. Uh, when people have issues, when people want to yell and complain, I'm the one that people come to. I shouldn't have told you that. Uh, but here we are. And we also have with us our experts for the morning. First, we have the uh, Chief Deputy United States Marshal for the District of Columbia handling all marshals' uh, duties at Superior Court, Mr. Robert Brandt. You got much more applause than I did. Uh, and we have uh, one of the staff attorneys for the DC Legal Aid Society, which has been very deeply involved in these new procedures, Ms. Samantha Koshgarian. Okay, now, I guess I'm supposed to be doing this too. In case you forgot, who's up there? Oh my gosh. It's not a mathematics quiz, but uh, Mr. Uh, Sunza, who wrote this wonderful book on the art of war, very famous over in uh, Asia, and it says that if you are going to win the battle, you need to know the other side as well as you know yourself. So we're going to start out with a little bit of knowing the other side. 31,058, that's the number of eviction court cases filed in 2017 in the District of Columbia. 
31,058. Oh, there's the answer. 5,499. Out of that 31,056 filings, there were various court procedures gone through. There were 5,499 judgments for possession rendered by the landlord tenant court, which I call the eviction court because that's the only thing it does. Landlord court and tenant court. Give me a break. Uh, 5,499 judgments for possession where they issued what is called a writ, a very technical term which basically means notice sent to the U.S. Marshals saying you can go take care of this. One thousand six hundred twenty-eight. Out of that five thousand four hundred ninety-nine, there were one thousand six hundred twenty-eight actual evictions carried out in the district in 2017. Why a lower number? There are many reasons. To some extent, people can pay off their rent arrearage and there's no eviction. That's a common thing that happens. Uh, there are various cures. There could be a flaw in the process. But we wound up with 1,628 evictions last year in the district. And let's try that again. Oh! One too many. Now again, talking about what happened before. Because you've got to know what we're facing here or else you don't know if there's been any improvement or lack of improvement. The court process gets completed. The court issues this writ which authorizes an eviction. That writ gets sent to the U.S. Marshal Service. The U.S. Marshal Service would send a copy of that writ to the tenant. Uh, one of those things, uh, be careful what comes in the mail, but better open it. And then, one day before the eviction, wait a minute, why am I, why am I not letting you follow along? That's so rude of me. One day before the eviction would happen, the marshals are going to say, oh, today we're going to be over in Southeast. Let's look at our writs from Southeast. Hmm. That's kind of, that's been here for a while. And they would schedule an eviction at this address. And you'd think, oh good, at least I had a day's notice. Not so fast, my friends. He's taking notes. I probably said something wrong. Uh, the housing provider knows. Because they contact housing provider, housing provider has to be able to say to the marshals, yes, we can have a squad of people available to carry everything out. Okay, it's settled. And then that evening... You could call a phone number and find out if you were on the next day's list. Not much notice. Not much time to get ready. So now we're up to that one day. And what happens? The marshals uh, send someone out to the address. The Neighborhood squad is there. Marshals have gone one, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, they're all here. And then the marshals had certain preliminary activities they would do. Uh, Bob, would you tell us what those were? Sure. And, and also you can tell them where I messed up earlier. 
I was just going to add the comment uh, that the reason we only gave one day of notice is because we worked in order through the evictions. Mm -hmm. And because it's a variable process and we didn't know how many we'd be able to get through, we couldn't really do them any earlier than that. Uh, so the old process, because of scheduling difficulties, really wasn't able to be managed mm -hmm. any other way. Uh, okay, so preliminary duties. When the marshal service arrives on the scene at the, uh, at the location where the eviction is to be carried out, we make contact with the landlord. We make sure they have a key or a locksmith present. Oh, no, 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 you're getting ahead of the game, sir. This is before. This is during the carry stuff out on the, the goons carry stuff out days. Right, that's still, yeah, that okay. was still a part of the process oh. uh, in the old process. Excuse me, we go still, right ahead. We still had to be able to make entry into the, uh, into the property uh, in the prior version. We've, we have scheduled this down to the syllable, you can tell. Go ahead. So we, we make sure the landlord has the ability to get into the property if the tenant isn't home. We would then go up to the, uh, up to the door, knock on the door, make contact with the tenant if they're home. If they are not home, we would use the key or we would have the locksmith make entry uh, into the property. We would then uh, speak to the tenant if they were there, explain to them that an eviction was, uh, was underway, and we would give them a few minutes to gather valuables. And while they were doing that, we would conduct a security sweep in the apartment to make sure all the people were present and there was nobody left in the uh, property and to make sure there weren't any other dangerous items that we could easily identify that would then be put out on the street. Those were the preliminary steps under the old process. Okay, preliminary steps out of the way. Uh, the hired crew would go in, take all remaining belongings, and put them out on the sidewalk, where DPW would probably write a ticket for trash. Uh, I'll get to your questions in a moment. Uh, you just write them on a the card. Write them on a the card, please. Now, Bob, this procedure we have just described was used in the district for decades, decades. And then you come along and you change this. Why? That's a very good question. Uh, uh, I had been part of that process for decades. So uh, to some extent, it was the process that we all knew. And it, it really, as, as full of challenges as it was, it, it worked, in a sense, uh, every day. But eventually, we started looking around, and, and we did a review about a year ago of 20 neighboring and similar metropolitan jurisdictions, and we found out that that process had really become an outlier amongst uh, other jurisdictions. When we did the review, we identified that there was only one other metropolitan jurisdiction that still moved property out to the mm -hmm. street, and that was Detroit. And even Detroit had additional sort of uh, provisions to make it a little cleaner uh, an activity. Uh, uh, we also, when we reviewed the, uh, the processes in other jurisdictions and what things we might be able to change and improve, uh, we had believed that there had to be a better way than just steadily working through the evictions and giving people only one day of notice uh, that the evictions were going to be in place. So we identified those two parts of the process and we decided to find a way to manage the process so that we could improve the notice to people and so that we could stop taking property and placing it on the public street. Uh, uh, and those were, the two, uh, those were the two things that we decided that we could find a way to accomplish, and then we set about uh, changing our procedures. Okay, now we've passed the education about the past. Now we're going to move over into the now. Again, the court does what the court does. Uh, there's a judgment for possession, a writ gets issued, it gets uh, sent over to the U.S. Marshals Service, and the U.S. Marshals Service does not wait. The U.S. Marshals Service schedules the eviction. 
right away. But then it's not one day notice. Bob, how much, what is your scheduling procedure? So under the new procedure, when the court sends us the court order, we contact the landlord, we give them the first available date we have uh, to conduct the eviction, that is at least 14 days from the date we contact the landlord. Uh, so there will be at least a 14 day notice period and most of the time, the notice is significantly more than 14 days. We reviewed the last six weeks of eviction since the new process went into place. And on average, from the date of issue to the date we carry out the court order is 30.7 days under the new process. That is almost exactly the same amount of time it took on average in the summertime to carry out evictions under the old process. So it's roughly the same amount of time to carry out the eviction but the tenant and the landlord will get notice at least two weeks ahead of time in the new process. So the eviction happens about the same schedule as it did before. The thing that has changed at this point is how much time does the tenant know in advance that is going to happen? Is that the gist? Yes. Okay, and housing provider obviously knows because you've been discussing this because housing provider has certain responsibilities to carry out. That makes sense. Now, at that point, there comes the notification to the tenant. There are three entities that are going to let that tenant know when the eviction is going to take place. Two are identified by statute, and one is identified, if nothing else, by this speech. The Office of the Tenant Advocate, my agency, will send a letter out to the tenant uh, notifying them what that date is going to be. That means that they've already told us. And we thank them and we appreciate that. Uh, and we offer uh, boxes, other packing materials to the tenant should they wish to take advantage of that opportunity so that they, given their two weeks to up to two months notice if they wanted to do the packing themselves and not trust someone else to break everything for them you know they can go ahead and do that about the same time the US Marshal Service is going to send a letter and inform them because they're the official people that's what statute tells them to do and there's the housing provider Housing provider has to send notice in three different ways to each tenant before eviction. Yep, uh, there's the first class mail. We all know about that. Uh, there's the conspicuous posting at the tenant's rental unit in a manner reasonably calculated to provide notice. Uh, and, and the housing provider, if it, if it is all possible, needs to do an electronic notification. That means sending an email to the tenant, sending a text message to the tenant, sending a telephone call to the tenant, all of which would again say what that date is. Now, Sam, you've been awfully quiet so far. How's that working? So the short answer is that we don't exactly know. Um, there are problems with some of those means of communication. I think a lot of you are probably familiar with the fact that sometimes have difficulty receiving mail for various reasons. 
Um, similarly, a lot of tenants don't have a telephone that works consistently necessarily that they can be reached at or an email address that they have consistent access to. And <coughs> there's some concern that we've heard particularly from colleagues of ours at Legal Counsel for the Elderly that a tenant who is out of the unit for an extended period of time, say in hospitalization or nursing home care, or who is incarcerated may not see the conspicuously posted notice. So while we understand that it is crafted to give as many tenants notice as possible, it's not a foolproof assurance that a tenant has notice of the eviction date. Okay, well, the law says that the housing provider is supposed to do all three of these things. Even though they have a choice of electronic means, they're supposed to give three notices to you. And you're saying they don't appear to not always be doing that. What is the remedy available to the tenant if they don't do all those things? Again, the law doesn't answer that question. What we at the Legal Aid Society would advise people to do is if they get, for example, a letter from the Office of the Tenant Advocate or the Marshal's notification but haven't received notice from their landlord is to go down to Landlord-Tenant Court, to the Landlord-Tenant Resource Center and try to get assistance filing an application to stay their writ on the basis that their landlord hasn't given them adequate notice. Having said that, because this process is fairly new and a lot of tenants don't have awareness of that opportunity or even the landlord's requirement to notify them, we haven't seen that happen, so we don't know how judges are going to respond to those applications or whether judges would stay writs on that basis. It's still absolutely worth a try if you or someone you know is in that situation. Okay, thank you. Now, after all this notice, we're finally going to get to that date of eviction. Uh, the marshal service will show up, the locksmith will show up at the property. Uh, and you're going to carry out your preliminary duties. Uh, have those changed at all since before? Actually, not really. The, uh, the process that we used under the old system is the same process that we use under the new system. We make contact with the landlord. We make sure that they have the ability to make entry into the property. Uh, we knock on the door. We speak to the tenant. We explain that we're there to carry out an eviction. Uh, and then we give them a few minutes to gather their belongings, mm -hmm. and we do a security sweep of the, uh, of the apartment. Uh, so the preliminary duties involved in, in performing the eviction are essentially the same under both sets of processes. Okay, the, then the lock gets changed. Marshal Service signs a little piece of paper saying, uh, Dear housing provider, this is yours now. Uh, Mr. Sadega, would you take her question, please? And Marshal Service departs, and that's, well, let me ask, is that the end of the story? Did I hear a no? You are correct. Maybe. Not if... That N is not supposed to be capitalized. <clears throat> um, not if any of the tenant's belongings are still in the property. <clears throat> then we still have more to the process. We have finished what I will call the first half of the new eviction process. If the tenant's belongings are still in the property, they're under lock and key, but something's going to have to happen next. And that's what we're getting to right now. Okay, the statute goes into great detail about this. Uh, the housing provider is going to send a letter uh, to any emergency contact previously identified by the tenant. Sam, do most tenants in your experience have emergency contacts on file with the housing provider? Most tenants have not given their landlord an emergency contact. Um, a lot of the people who are most likely to have given their landlords emergency contacts are people who, um, so landlord is the housing authority, which as I think we'll discuss later, uh, is handled differently under this legislation in some ways. Um, having said that, it would be a good idea given this legislation to give your landlord an emergency contact, someone you'd like them to let know in the event of an eviction, how you can retrieve your belongings. Um, if, they, if you already do have an emergency contact on file with your landlord, they would be required to contact that person. Okay, now, the housing provider also is to post a notice to the tenant who actually no longer lives there. Um, 
How's that working out, Sam? So we don't know the answer to that. Um, and as I think I had, had mentioned to Dennis earlier, um, one of the points of pride of the Legal Aid Society is that very few of the tenants we represent get evicted. And what that means is that we don't have a lot of evidence from tenants about how the process has worked for tenants who have been through evictions. Um, what it does mean is that if you, someone, for example, hadn't received notice of their eviction, came home to find that their locks had been changed on them through this process, that tenant would receive notice. Um, so if, te if landlords are posting these notices appropriately and there are some problems with the notices they're required to post that I think, again, we'll get into in a minute, um, but if a landlord is properly posted, the tenant will at least know what has happened. Okay, I didn't make a slide for exactly what needs to be in that notice. So read carefully. I wouldn't even take notes. You can come to our website and learn more about this. And, but it's supposed to include the name and phone number of at least one housing provider representative whom the tenant may contact and who can grant access to the rental unit on the housing provider's behalf. It's supposed to give the phone number for the Office of the Tenant Advocate, that's us. The phone number of the United States Marshal Service, that's him. The phone number of the District of Columbia Landlord Tenant Court, they're the ones that ordered the eviction to begin with. And the text of the new statute, at least this subsection of it, uh, which is made part of that notice and is probably going to be in fine print. I hope you didn't bother write all that down at once. Okay, but now we've, here's the situation we found ourselves in. There's been an eviction. Lock has been changed. Tenant is over here. Unless there's been uh, some pre-planning for this, all the tenant stuff is locked up in here and the tenant no longer has a key. Uh, well, I, I think that's probably better than coming home from work, finding the half of your possessions that are least valuable still sitting on a sidewalk somewhere. Uh, the rest of them are probably in a pawn shop somewhere. But still that's a problem. So, the law provides that the tenant and the landlord need to come to an agreement. And the tenant gets to go in and visit their possessions, box up, move out any of those possessions that they want to take with them. The rules are, and they're probably already up there so you can follow along as I read this one, um, no less than eight contiguous hours. Note that word contiguous. Sam, should I take that to mean that that does not mean two hours on Monday, two hours on Tuesday, two hours on Wednesday, etc.? Yes, you should. One visit. So plan ahead if you're in that situation. Uh, the parties are supposed to agree. Oh my gosh. If the parties were so easily coming to, to agreement, we probably wouldn't have an eviction to begin with. So I'm going to guess that there are times the parties have difficulty agreeing. Sam, what happens? Um, so what we think would happen, and again, this is not entirely clear under the legislation, is that if a tent, so what the legislation, Oh, <laughs> thank you. What the legislation does provide for is that a tenant is entitled to what is called injunctive relief if a landlord is not allowing them to access their property for the eight hours. What, what that means is that they can go to court and have the court order the landlord to let them in for their eight hours and get their belongings. Um, there are a couple of things that are problematic about the way the legislation is written in terms of this right that tenants have. One is that it's not entirely clear where the tenant would assert this right. We think that the answer would be to go down to landlord-tenant court 
and with the help of the Landlord Tenant Resource Center, file what's called the temporary restraining order to have a judge order your landlord to let you in to get your things. But again, as far as we're aware from talking to folks who work at the Landlord Tenant Resource Center, they haven't had someone try this yet. So we don't actually know for sure that a judge is going to order that after that happens. That's what we would advise people to do for the time being. The other thing that is a problem about how this legislation is written is nothing in the law actually requires the landlord's notice to tell tenants that they're allowed to come in for eight hours and get their things. And what that means is that a tenant who isn't here um, or hasn't had a lawyer to consult with might not even know when they arrive home and find all their things locked in their unit that they're allowed to go in and get their stuff. So one thing that we're asking you all today until we can fix this problem in the law is to really kind of be voices out in your communities letting people know that after an eviction they have the right within seven days after their eviction to go into the unit for eight hours and that if their landlord isn't letting them do that they should go to court to try to force them to let them do it. Thank you. Now, how long does the housing provider need to keep those belongings in the unit. Now the, here's the statutory way, it's written up here. Seven days plus any Sunday plus any holiday. So to me that's a lot for my old brain to remember. Almost every week of seven days has a Sunday in it. So I just say eight days plus any holidays. And to me, it's simpler. Use whatever system is simpler for you. But for many people, in many situations, those eight days plus holiday, they're going to expire. There's still stuff in that unit. Now, the ball's in the landlord's court. The landlord basically can dispose of that stuff any way they want to, just about. Now, one thing they cannot do, they cannot put the stuff outside. Unless it's in a certified DPW dumpster. They can't do that. It would be just like if we didn't have the law. They can't do that. And can the housing provider take your stuff and sell it? Yes. However, any revenue that comes in from that sale first has to be applied to any tenant responsibility like a rent or rearage. So that is a very important thing to remember. And if there's any more money, let's say the rent arrearage was $1,000 and sale of the stuff resulted in revenue coming in of uh, $1,500. That leaves $500 extra. Does that mean that the housing provider is, gets to go have a nice dinner that night? No. That money comes back to the tenant. Oh, yes, Sam, please. Um, so the money that is applied against rent that the tenant owes, it, a court doesn't have to have already found that you owe that rent under the law. It's just whatever the landlord determines that the tenant owes. So if someone thinks that the landlord has kept more, rent than, more money than what they actually owed in rent, that person should go to small claims court and file a case to try to make sure that the landlord didn't keep money they weren't really entitled to. Okay, Amir, I believe there's one back here for you. Uh, now, the statute has an exemption from all this. I've got to ask about it. The statute exempts D.C. Housing Authority from following this process at all. Yeah, wait a minute. Wait a minute. So, Bob, what is your experiences when... The, we're talking about a housing authority property. The marshal service doesn't change its process regardless of whether it's a housing authority uh, property or not. Our process is the same. The housing authority hasn't asked us to do anything differently and my understanding, although it's, it's 
purely an anecdotal understanding, is that the housing authority is basically treating this the same way as, as private landlords are. Okay. So no change from your angle. Sam, what have you observed? Um, similarly, anecdotally, from what, what we've heard from tenants and from the housing authority is that for the time being, they are just following the law, but they could change that at any point and do a different process after the lock change, really without having to tell anyone that they were going to be changing their practices. The other thing that's important to know is that it's actually not just housing authority tenants who are exempt under this law. It's any tenant who is, who's um, apartment isn't covered by the Rental Housing Act, and there are some funny little um, things that are, happen to be not included under the Rental Housing Act. And what that means is that if you or someone you know is sued for eviction, even if there's already a writ and you think, okay, I've already lost this case, it's over, they should still go seek legal advice about what their rights are going to be for their specific situation. Okay, now, the next question is, are there any external influences that can disrupt the schedule that the Marshal Service will have so carefully laid out? And the answer is yes. Number one, and these are both weather related, if at 8 a.m. the weather station at National Airport says the temperature there is predicted to dip below 32 degrees Fahrenheit, otherwise known as freezing, uh, there will be no eviction. There's something missing from that statute. And in time. One could read the statute as meaning if the weather service predicts that any time in the next 25 years they think it'll go below freezing, there's no eviction. That's wishful thinking. Bob, how do the marshals interpret that? We, we followed the, what we believe is the intent of the council, which was not to deviate from the prior, prior restriction, uh, which was written to say for the 24 hour period following the check at 8 a.m. So each 8 a.m. check carries us through to the next 8 a.m. check the next morning. So if the temperature will fall below 32 degrees, Anytime during that 24 hour period, we will not complete evictions uh, during that time period. You know, Bob, that sounds a lot like what the old eviction statute was. Right. So, so they kept it the same by changing it. Okay. I'm not going to complain. Now, but here's the other thing they did change, and I want you to really notice this, and that's why I got it underlined. <clears throat> when precipitation is falling at the location of the rental unit. In other words, if I understand this right, Bob, it's scheduled time for an eviction. Marshall gets in the car drives over to wherever the address is and says, oh, look at this. I, I'm, there's no locks going to be changed today. Uh, is that basically the gist of it, Bob? Basically. If, okay. if at the time we arrive, there is precipitation. So if it is raining or snowing uh, or sleeting, um, we will... Go up to the premises, we will knock on the door, we will talk to the tenant, we will tell them, we have an eviction scheduled today. We can't complete it because there is precipitation right now. We will be back the next available day where weather does permit. And we will post a notice on the door saying that same statement so that if a tenant is not home, there is a clear uh, indication that we will return each day, theoretically, until the weather permits us to carry out the eviction. Okay, I want to make this very clear to everyone. There will be no more letters. There will be no more text, phone calls, emails from housing provider. You've got a note on the door saying an eviction is in progress 
and will be completed the next available opportunity, and that is the notice. Uh, it's kind of a tend to beware at that point. Can, mm. can I actually ask a question about that? You um, may. Does that mean that you would not return later that day if precipitation has that, that's stopped correct. falling? Uh, our practice is that we will give them to the next day. Uh, uh, we made the, the determination that it's just not practical or desirable to be running all over the city trying to find a window uh, that we can get uh, an eviction scheduled in. We will place it on hold and we will put it back in the schedule for the next day. Any type of precipitation is the same rule, whether it be... Oh, accumulated snow would not, if, if the temperature is not going to be below 32 degrees, that would not prohibit uh, the eviction from going forward. Mm, okay, now, I believe this is the point that I have to take a little digression. So let me move to the digression part of this stage. And this is going to involve a little lesson about D.C. and the way council passes its bills and the types of bills that the D.C. council can pass. I said earlier that this uh, procedure we're talking about is not yet permanent. It, is, it was passed as an emergency. What does that really mean? Well, Thank you, but temporarily is a good word. It means that the council can pass the bill, it goes to the mayor, the mayor signs it, and it's effective. But for a limited time. It's only effective for 90 days. So the, in theory, and I would say only in theory, the procedures we are describing expire on October 24. I don't, but do not write that down. Because the council has another kind of thing they can pass. It's called a temporary bill. And we go through, first of all, it's got to be basically the same as the emergency. So don't expect any changes for that. Again, council passes it. Mayor signs it. In this case, the D.C. Council has already acted, and I believe it was September 18th, they passed the temporary bill. It's not effective yet. But is, Joel, have I got that date correct? The mayor has not yet signed it yet. I, the mayor, yes, as I said, it's not effective yet for two reasons. The mayor hasn't signed it yet. The mayor has until October 9th to sign it. I suspect that the mayor will sign it. And then it gets sent off to the U.S. Congress, which has 30 congressional days for review, which, remember, is not 30 calendar days. And no one in this room really knows how long 30 days will be for this temporary uh, bill. Once Congress has had the opportunity to review it, then it will become a temporary law. And I have to be, since I'm over here in the wonkish digression corner, I've got to talk about the wonkish language. We've been talking about an emergency act, but there will soon be a temporary law. What's the real difference? probably none for your sake. It's something only the wonkish people will really be involved and care about. But there might be someone here that really is into that. And once that temporary law becomes effective, yes, it is temporary. It is effective for 225 days. Now, those of you that are really mathematically clever have already figured out wait, the Emergency Act expires October 24. 
the mayor has not yet signed the temporary bill, and Congress has 30 congressional days, which is always more than 30, for it to do its review, the Emergency Act is going to expire. Do not worry. The council has its dark magic ways of kind of stretching that out, and I'm not going to get into all that right now because there's only so much wonk I can stand to do here. But the council is going to need to do a permanent law. And they have theoretically started. Uh, my understanding is that the bill that uh, council member Trayon White introduced some months ago that started all these back-end procedures is being considered the introduction of the permanent law. And, <clears throat> well, first of all, I have... Here are the points that I am told I need to tell you about the permanent law. I'm going to read them because I didn't memorize them. Once introduced, the bill must then be referred to a committee. Then the committee must hold a hearing. Then the committee must mark up and approve the bill with any amendments. And then the full council must approve the bill on two different votes. Then the bill gets to the mayor's desk and if signed for congressional review again. And once that happens, you have, this says, there is time for a permanent measure to become law prior to the end of the calendar year, meaning this year. There's time for the permanent eviction law to become permanent. For the end of this calendar year, time's running a little bit short, but it's out there. Now, here are the things that I really want you to know. Some in the council recognize that the public has to have a chance to testify in front of them about the permanent bill. Some in the council probably think that that was done last Monday. In which case, my telling you about it doesn't do a whole lot of good, but that's, anyway. Although there are also some people in the council who think, no, we need to have another public session where people can go down and talk about it. So be aware of that. Even if you are not able to go down to the council and testify in front of them about your opinions, what needs to be in that permanent law, there's always going to be an opportunity to send in written comments that they will consider. And there's always a deadline for that. Now you notice that there's a lot of dates here that I've talked about that we don't really have actual dates to tell you about. Sorry about that. Uh, but there's a cure. If you are not already signed up for the OTA stakeholder email service. Please see Mr. Cohn standing right here or anyone else from OTA that you see here. Get yourself signed up for that and you will be emailed a notice of all these dates so you will know what has to be done when. Dennis, why don't we have a piece of paper up here? People can come up and uh, sign, uh, sign up for it. After, you mean like this piece of paper? Perfect. With this pen, if you need to sign up to get on the OTA stakeholder list serve, after this session, please come up and sign yourself up right here. Okay, discretion over. Now we go back to our regular presentation. So, how can you make your voice heard? Okay. As I already said, you can go testify at a council hearing. You can send in written comments to the committee considering that permanent bill. 
You can go down to your council member's office and bug them until they sit down with you or have a staff member sit down with you. <clears throat> it may be, but you can do that. You have one other opportunity right away, because some of you have ideas right now and they're about to burst out of you. And there's a danger that tomorrow you'll forget. So do remember, at 1.30 today, Room 5, the legislative policy update session led by Mr. Cohn, be there, Room 5 at 1.30. Eat lunch first. <laughs> and if you have questions, now I'm getting behind in this, where am I? Oh, oh you already know all that. You know that. So now it is question time, and right now we're taking questions from cards talking about the current procedures. Save your comments about what comes next for 130, room 5. Okay, do you want to read, or you, how do you want to handle that? Once again, you see, we've, we've planned this to every detail. know that you probably don't have anything better to do on a Saturday morning than to be here with us, but we really appreciate it. Let's get a hand for Bob and Sam real quick. Thank you. Uh, so uh, I'm going to read out these questions out loud. Uh, some of them were already answered, uh, and there was a quick, <laughs> somebody grabbed me out in the hallway and said, hey, wait a second, he's, he's giving the wrong information. They, they don't do this stuff. They put your stuff out on the street. So that was the old law. We're talking about the new law. And uh, so one of, the, one of the first questions is, the D.C. Council passed the ev Eviction Emergency Reform Amendment Act, which mandated tenants' property to be stored for 30 days at a cost incurred by a landlord. Uh, now, we have our uh, legislative director, Joel Cohn, right here. And the, the short answer to that question is because uh, what, we sh uh, what the panelists told you today is, uh, the landlord doesn't have to store your property for 30 days. They have to keep it in the house for seven days. Uh, the old law was, is no, no, not effective. The new law is effective. And Joel is going to give you a quick 30-second uh, explanation of that. So, uh, Amir almost said it all. Uh, what happened was the council did pass at the end of June an emergency measure that would have required private, uh, maintaining the tenant's property in private storage facility, then second guess that uh, on the basis that it was too dramatic, too radical a change to do on an emergency basis. So the idea is still on the table for purposes of the permanent legislation yet to be considered. Uh, what they did is they repealed this act, Act 22-425, and replaced it, repealed and replaced with Act 22-426, which is the seven-day in-unit storage uh, uh, law that is in place now until October 24th. Thank you, Joel. All right, now uh, back to the panelists. Uh, how does the eviction process work with a senior citizen or a person with disability that does not have an emergency contact? Uh, what happens to their property? Who would like to take that? So, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, as the emergency legislation was being crafted, there was some discussion of whether there should be some kind of additional protection for people who live with disabilities or for elderly tenants. Um, as it was passed, there is no difference in how the process works. So they will get exactly the same notices and their property will be held in the unit for seven days and they have the right to eight hours of access to remove their property from the unit. Yes, ma'am. Um, as the law stands right now, there is no difference in how elderly and disabled tenants are treated after the eviction process is, as the eviction process is carried out. Yes, or I don't know if I can. <clears throat> uh, No, it, probably not, uh, and I was going to ask to add, uh, 
I was going to ask to add uh, my comments into that. The marshal service can, at its discretion, postpone the carrying out of an eviction. And we have several times since this new process took place. In fact, just a couple of weeks ago, we postponed an eviction for a very ill child that was uh, in the unit. And we came back about a week later uh, when they had had an opportunity to recover considerably. The Marshal Service can, at its discretion, take those things into consideration and postpone the conduct of the evictions. That's latitude that the deputies on the ground did not used to have that we have put into place along with the, the, the official changes. There is a little more discretion by the deputies now to be able to take serious situations like that into account. The Marshal Service is required to effectively and efficiently carry out the court's orders. So there's still an obligation for us to get through the eviction process. But we can, if the circumstance warrants, postpone or delay an eviction to allow for some consideration for situations like medical considerations or other extenuating circumstances. And if I can just add quickly, the court itself, the landlord-tenant court, also has what, is, what people call equitable authority, which basically means if something is just too unfair, sometimes they can change how things work. So if you get a notice of eviction and for some reason related to disability or related to your status as a senior citizen, it would be very difficult for you to be out on the date that's suggested. It's still worth trying to go down to landlord-tenant court and file something to see if a judge can do anything to try to change how that process process is going to play out for you. Thank you. All right, next question. What happens if property is damaged and or vandalized uh, during this process? So um, the law does not answer the question of what happens, for example, if a unit is broken into during the seven days and things are stolen. Um, a tenant may very well have legal claims against their landlord, um, not in landlord-tenant court, but outside of landlord-tenant court um, under other laws for damage to their property or things like that. But this law itself does not give any remedies to tenants for what happens to their property. Oh, I see. Oh. Well, all right. What if the unit is damaged? I think that's, that, that was your question, ma'am? All right. So yeah, what if the, what if the unit, unit has been damaged by the tenants? So similarly, there's nothing that changes about how that works under this law. Um, the landlord would have their same rights to retain the security deposit and to file a lawsuit in other courts against the tenant for any damage above the security deposit that they think has been done to the unit. Okay. When, all right, we'll, ma'am, we'll get, we'll get to all your questions. Uh, when property is left behind and locks are changed, can tenants stay in the unit if the rent has been paid? So the tenant's right to pay up and stay in the unit ends at the time the locks are changed, even though the property is still in the unit. Um, a tenant who has otherwise had an okay relationship with their landlord, there may well be landlords who say, you know what, I'm happy to take the back rent and sign a new lease with you and have you back in the unit, um, rather than having to spend the money to have the stuff moved out of the unit and find a new tenant. So it's, if you feel like your landlord might be open to that, it's worth asking them if they're open to sort of creating that new contract with you, but you no longer have a legal right to redeem the tenancy after the marshals have left and the locks have been changed. I got an easy one here. It says, can the landlord do an ev eviction without a writ? And I think by now we all know what the answer is no. Uh, it's called self-eviction. It's not allowed. Uh, we, we have another question here. It says, how, what happens if the U.S. Marshal doesn't arrive? Uh, does that ever happen? It, it, it can happen, actually. Uh, uh, there's a variety of reasons that could cause the Marshal Service to arrive. We might have had other emergencies that... that took precedence over carrying out evictions for that day. If the marshal has not arrived on your scheduled eviction date, the notice we send out says we will be there that day or the first day we can get there thereafter. I don't believe during the last seven weeks or so we've had a single time where we haven't shown up, uh, but it could happen. And if it does, the notice we give you says that date or as soon as we can get back. So if it did happen, we would come back the next day we were available, which would almost certainly be the next day. Uh, no. 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 Um, so I'm sorry? 
When did it happen? If maintenance put her things on the curb before the marshal service had come out, that was an illegal eviction. I, I, again, I, I shouldn't say that because I don't know all of the facts of the situation, but from what you've said, that's what it sounds like. So uh, I apologize, ma'am. Uh, we're actually about to wrap up here. I don't want to. Uh, I don't want to uh, leave without uh, actually addressing this. Uh, we actually have a legal clinic uh, here uh, uh, today. So for specific questions about things that have happened to you or people that you know, uh, actually we we welcome uh, for you to actually come to the legal clinic and we can answer those questions for you. Otherwise, uh, obviously, Legal Aid is here for you. The Office of Tenant Advocate is here for you. So those specific questions, please bring those to us, and uh, we'll, we'll try to help you through that situation. Uh, we have, uh, sh should I go ahead and wrap up? Or? Yeah. Uh, if you have any other questions, please come up to us, and we'll try to answer them on a one-on-one on -one -on -one basis. And, uh, That's a, that's a 130 question. Yes. Now, uh, I would like to take advantage of this opportunity to thank everyone that was here. It's been a great audience. I notice that unlike many presentations, this audience has grown as the presentation has been in effect. That's wonderful. So thank you. Thank you to Chief Deputy U.S. Marshal Robert Brandt. Thank you to Staff Attorney Legal Aid Society, Samantha Kashgarian. Kashgarian? Yeah. And Amir, would you please uh, point that clicker over at these gentlemen? Although it doesn't matter because they've already changed the slideshow. <laughs> <laughs> so, thank you very much. Thank you. Here.